Okay, just waiting. Okay, it is live now. Uh, now we can start. So uh, uh, I am thanking you on behalf of EHS Plus Center, NSU, and ILO International Labor Organization for participating to this event. Uh, today we are having with us Honorable Dean, School of Business and Economics, Professor Dr. Uh, Abdul Hanan Choudhury, and Professor Muhammad Ali Noki, Vice Chancellor, Stanford University, and the presenter, uh, Mr. George Feller. The event is jointly organized by EHS Plus Center, NECU and ILO. EHS Plus Center is the hub to deal with issues related to environment, health and health and safety. This is the first EHS uh, Plus Center in the world established by IHC, Institute of Sustainable Committees in the year 2014. Since then, the center relentlessly has announced many trainings, workshops and develops EHS focused courses. We are very happy today to get George Feller, Chief Technical Advisor, ILO, Bangladesh, among us. Today, he is going to present and give us an idea regarding performance-based fire safety design. Before I go into deep, I'd like to invite Honorable Professor Dr. Um, Abdul Hanan Choudhury, Director of EHS Plus Center, to say a few words. Sir, please. Uh, good morning, and thank you, uh, Sharia Raj. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, Professor Mohammad Alinoki and also our esteemed presenter today, George Feller from ILO, the Chief Technical Advisor of ILO, for agreeing with us that he's going to give a talk on performance-based design for fire safety, enabling innovation without compromising on safety. I must say that while being part of the North South University and also EHS Plus Center. I'm very happy to see that Sharia Raj has been able to organize such an important and very pertinent uh, you know, session in relation to our country and uh, within a, you know, a specific uh, you know, focus on industry and also industrial sector, particularly uh, the this speaker, uh, George Feller, has wide experience on working on fire safety, safety hazards in, in uh, industrial and building structure. Uh, this is something I would say very important. And I must say that while well, this was session would be very uh, evaluating and it is obviously going to benefit all the stakeholders of the ecosystem that we are focusing today. EHS Plus Center at North South University is established with an objective that it is going to ensure the you know uh, safety and you know environments environmental safety hazards occupational hazards uh, you know uh, in the industrial sector of our country. As many of you know already, Sharier has uh, mentioned that well this is a ISC Institute of Sustainable Communities supported. Uh, center that we have established after the Rana Plaza and Tazreen Garments disaster in our country. And George is going to relate his training in line with that, how safety is so very important. And I'm sure that he's going to focus on how risk in, you know, informed performance-based approach is going to help, uh, you know, the industrial sector of our country. And he's obviously going to focus in his speech. I'm sure that well, uh, you know, the designing the fire safety, um, you know, and analyzing the, um, you know, um, you know, fire safety system in the industrial uh, sector, particularly in the industrial sector. I know it is very important for all the, uh, you know, building safety, but you know, rather than talking about structural issues, you know. Uh, when a little fire occurs in uh, specifically in our country, we have seen that well how devastated the human lives were well, those who are working in the in the industry and businesses. So fire safety is something uh, very important. We really need to focus on training and awareing people, those who are uh, involved with industry and also those who are dealing with the mega structure high, you know, 
uh, high storage buildings uh, so that we can see a beautiful ecosystem is going to create in our country and where we are going to save the people, those who are uh, residing or using those structured uh, building. And uh, this session obviously going to help us in terms of identifying, you know, uh, to be cautious uh, about the direct and in indirect effect of the fire, the, you know, incident that happened, you know. So I think I think I would not prolong my speech. I must thank uh, both Professor uh, Ali Noki, who is be, uh, has been also uh, a very renowned, actually, architect of our country and running an university also, working also in the uh, safety and other issues in our country. And George Feller is uh, actually a globally renowned individual. I think those who are going to attend today they are going to definitely benefit from this session. And I must thank that, well, uh, Shahriya Raj are going to, he's going to organize this kind of session with the platform EHS Plus Center in our country so that we can actually uh, disseminate knowledge uh, of, uh, you know, this kind of very uh, specific area that enabling, um, you know, innovation without compromising safety. That is something very important in the context of our country. So I would like to say that, well, uh, George Feller, you are very experienced even about Bangladesh. You know that how vulnerable uh, Bangladeshi RMG sector and industry sector as a whole, and also the way that unplanned industrialization and also unplanned city uh, you know, buildings are uh, developed. You need to you know, give us good guidance and also give all sort of caution those who are actually using uh, this kind of building. And I'm sure that, well, as soon as we see that more awareness we can do through this kind of training or workshop or sessions, uh, our people are going to be uh, benefiting from this. So I'm, I'm, I'm very humbled to say that, well, George Feller, thank you very much for giving us time. And North South as a whole, the North South University is very proud to have you. Uh, and also, Professor Ali Noki, uh, thank you very much for your consent to be part of this session. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, sir, for your encouraging words. Uh, now, i like to request uh, Professor Ali Noki for uh, saying a few words because he's an architect as well as he's running a university. So he has multidisciplinary knowledge uh, that we are going to present. So please, Professor Noki. Thank you, Raj. Uh, well, I will not take much time, I assure you. I am very much eager to, I am waiting, uh, heartfully, to, for, to listen to the lecture of George Feller because, uh, well, to the architects, it's always a, a crisis to have a balance between creativity and safety. And George has his experience in RMG sector in Bangladesh, and I have heard that he has his experience to work with uh, Jaha Hadid. Am I right? So that, that challenge is extreme in your life and I, I'm, I will not waste our time and I, I will request George to go ahead and give us some light on how you have felt to work with Jihadid while you are actually looking after the safety and security of the building. Uh, I welcome you and I thank uh, North South University, I thank Raj, I, I thank Professor Hanan for such a, such a program, such a platform so that we can uh, we can have this new experience in architecture we bangladeshi are also going to uh, have different aspects of creativity and safety and security and bring a harmony to come so thank you very much i would uh, george it's your platform now thank you so uh, george um, so i'm yes. giving you the floor please uh, you may start your presentation please okay Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, and uh, just um, thanks to um, the North South University EHS Plus Center, and um, welcome to Professor Chowdhury, Professor uh, Naki, and um, and and um, Raj. Thanks for thanks for organizing this and giving me this platform. I think what I you know, I've um, I'm, I'm working in Bangladesh in the RMG sector on the remediation of, of buildings, and I think what um, what um, prompted me to want to give this type of talk is that 
I've what what strikes me about going, my experience here is that whenever there's a fire incident, there's a lot of attention put on inspectorates and remediation and rescue rescue operations, but there's very little dialogue about the design of the building in the first place. And so my experience as a consultant was focused on trying to get the building safe in the first place to ensure people could get out safely before you had to rely on inspectorates or rescue work. And um, I think those, those aspects are very important and that's what I've been dealing with in my day-to-day -day life in ILO. But um, my, I just wanted to share my experience of a previous um, previous experience on getting getting buildings right in the first place and um, it's the talk is not going to be about the enforcement of fire safety in in bangladesh i think that's uh, that's for another day what i'm hoping to do is just um, highlight the efforts that should be put in and the importance that should be given in the design process to getting the building right to ensure that people can get out of the building safely. So that's just a very short introduction to my speech. Now I'll share my screen and go to the presentation. I hope you can see my screen now. If you can't, let me know. Make it fully screen. Uh, Okay, so the title of my talk is then performance-based design for fire safety and uh, demonstrating the, the approach and what it can what it can be used for. Um, I'm going to address um, address it following this, um, this these key points. Before I talk about performance-based design, I always like to talk just about the more traditional and and the the only um, way that approach is used in, in a lot of countries the prescriptive prescriptive approach prescriptive codes like the bmdc in bangladesh and then i'll, I'll talk about uh, the development the whys and how of the, of the performance-based approach look at some case studies of how that you can enable innovation using this methodology I'll point out a few typical cases that uh, benefit from this approach um, and then importantly is how this applies to the process of design and the, the approvals process because that's that's an important aspect of it as well so if we just go to the the background of prescriptive codes i just so you can say that uh, uh, fire regulations have existed from time immemorial there have always been regulations Throughout history, you can find evidence of them. In the past, they were mainly directed at control of ignition and prevention of fire spread. They often were not very effectively um, implemented, and we can see examples throughout history of huge um, configurations in cities um, throughout the world. And it's only fairly recently that we've introduce the fire safety aspects into our building regulations and that the catalyst for that um, in europe was the, the what, they, what became known as the great fire of london in the 17th century that was a, a fire which started in a bakery in in the city of london and it spread uncontrolled throughout a large part of the city at the end of the incident, about uh, seven, it was estimated about 70% of the city of London had been destroyed by that fire, resulting from that one small incident. So there was enormous damage. It was a national catastrophe. Uh, I, I believe that England were at war with France at the time, so that added to, it's a bit like adding it to COVID these days. But after that, um, committees were drawn up and with a, with a um, conviction that they couldn't allow something like this to happen again. Because this had to bring in um, whatever measures necessary to ensure that that didn't happen. And so what they did, because of the, the way the fire spread between, between buildings, um, they brought in regulations which specified that all new buildings from then on would have to maintain a certain distance across the street from other buildings, and they would have to be separated 
one from the other by uh, non-combustible material, which basically meant stone or brick um, partition between different different premises. So that was that was brought into law, and as I said, that was a building regulation. No building could be built without taking that into account. And that served its purpose for a long time, and, uh, and it was very effective. So a lot of other countries started um, following that example. But then um, other incidents came about which made people ponder, ponder the issue again. And one such incident, again, occurring in London, was um, during, the, during the Industrial Revolution, they had the, these huge warehouses sprung up Along the along the river, uh, uh, they bought up a number of properties to build huge complexes, and there was a fire in one of those in the city. It didn't extend beyond the, the premises, but there was a, it was an uncontrolled fire in the city, which could have resulted in a disaster quite easily. But that it didn't. But after that, a similar process. They went through, through as before. I said, well, can't let this happen again, and so. They introduced into the building regulations the idea of compartmentation. The fire, the fire authorities were consulted and they were asked you know, how, how big a, you couldn't control this fire, so how big a fire can you control? And they came up with numbers which have found their way into the building regulations there. And that has found its way into a lot of codes even today. Um, it's, it's based on some numbers which were, which were produced at that time. So then this process continued. You see that those two incidents basically address controlling the, the, the spread of the fire. And it's, could, today we would say it's more property protection issues than anything else. But then in the 20th century, they started adding layers and layers to these codes. And just about everything added in the 20th century is directed at life safety getting people out buildings safely. In 1911, um, following a number of incidents in theaters in the early, in the early 20th century, where uh, uh, close to 100 people were killed in three separate incidents over a, a short number of years. And then you know, the, the process started again saying, you know, we can't let this carry on happening. What do we do to ensure that people can get out of buildings safely? And uh, that's where they brought into a, a layer of brought in, which addressed um, travel distances to, to an escape route, the quick flow through the doors, the door widths, the stair widths, if they were, and that type of thing, which we, which we find in our codes today still. And then as other incidents cropped up, layer after layer was added into this based on important incidents. I listed a few there. In 1973, after a fire in the discotheque in Dublin, where this uh, it had been um, the, the wall and ceiling linings had been covered with carpets to increase the or carpet type material to increase the um, acoustics. Uh, there was a small fire in one part of that discotheque that, sp that spread rapidly across the ceiling, cut off all escape routes, and people couldn't get out the building. So another layer was brought into the specific code then on um, flame spread of materials that you could have on wall and ceiling lines. Around about the same time, um, shopping centers, shopping precincts started um, developing the mall concept where beforehand shops would open up onto an open street. And then they started covering them, uh, covering the mall for um, to make the shopping experience better and the all weather environment. And, but the problem there was um, um, the, the issue of smoke emanating from a fire in a shop being trapped in this uh, covered mall and spreading much quicker than people could move to get out of the, the exits. And so a layer of smoke control was introduced into, into the legislation, into the codes. 1979, there was more on fire resistant furnishings, 1981, more on um, management of the fire safety measures. So you can see this process was this built up over, over time. But I think what we, the thing we can learn from this it is it's all a reaction 
the incidents. So they, um, an incident would happen, they bring about a committee, they would um, bring about a, and add another player to ensure that that didn't happen again. But it doesn't stop it happening in, in the future. So I think we can say on prescriptive codes, they've always been there to prevent a repeat of incidents which happened in the past. It's, they're very good depositories of cu accumulated wisdom that's been developed over decades, over centuries. And we can look at them as a recipes of good practice design measures to address fire safety. But what we started seeing, what we started to be seeing in the latter half of the 20th century, um, particularly after the Second World War, was um, that techniques, construction um, techniques developed, new materials came on board, and that process speeded up a lot. And so um, many new forms and, and uses of buildings came about, which the, these, the codes which are building on accumulated previous knowledge were not addressing the issues arising from, from these new forms and, and shapes. So that led to this, the, the, the start to start thinking about a different approach. I think the, the first attempt um, to, to address this issue was by developing a lot of tailored codes, tailored to a certain type of building. So you've got a tailored code for shopping centers, um, for the, the, with atrium buildings, but it was all prescriptive guidance. And as all the different forms and, and different uh, possibilities came about, these codes became too lengthy, too cumbersome, and too many of them. And people at the time were saying that the only people who really knew their way properly around these codes were the lawyers, because they were being repeatedly asked to um, consult and to, uh, uh, to, to adjudicate on cases um, related to fire safety uh, measures in the codes. So it was recognized that a new approach was needed. And what in this new approach, I wanted to maintain the experience of the existing codes, but supplement it with something that would allow alternatives. So new legislation was introduced. And um, this, uh, I mean, in, the, in the UK, this happened in the early 90s. In the, in Australasia, Australia, Japan, it happened when, in, shortly after that. I think in the Scandinavian countries, it happened around about the same time. But what the, what this legislation, what this change in legislation meant, was that the codes, the, uh, what the, the content of the code was given a different status in in the law. The legislation said that. Um, the codes became what they what they call technical documents, and the legislation assumed that if you met all the measures in that technical document, you were deemed to satisfy the fire safety requirements. But it also allowed for alternatives, as long as they could justify that that, that um, alternative provided an equivalent level of safety. So it's sort of to go to two layers. Two, the legislation recognizes that there are two ways of going about this now. You apply that recipe of measures, which is contained in the technical document, or you can propose alternatives. But if you propose an alternative, it is up to you to justify it. So <clears throat> the legislation then um, provided higher level statements on the basic requirements for fire safety. And Generally, they were divided into uh, five or six areas. Some countries with five, some six, but generally they would follow uh, the approach of um, the, the basic requirements on internal and external fire spread, on means of escape, fire safety systems design, structural stability, and the access and measures required for, for fire services. And the George. typical... George, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I am getting feedback that uh, is it possible for you to speak a bit louder? Okay, is is that better? I'm holding the mic 
place it yeah, in the mouth. Yeah, I, I think it's better now. Th thank you. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, no problem. Please. Okay, so the, these are the, the high level statements. And the, the typical high level statement is um, it's, um, mentioned there below. It would say something like the building shall be designed and constructed so that there are appropriate provisions for early warning and means of escape in the case of fire to a place of safety outside the building. So that doesn't give any, any measures, but it tells you what the, what the objective what the objective is. And the legislation then says if, if, um, if you apply everything in what was previously in the code, in the technical document, you, you deem to satisfy that basic requirement. But if you want to um, satisfy it by some other means, you can use a performance-based approach. And that approach um, was, um, you know, it, it took off globally. Uh, people saw the the, uh, uh, the the possibilities of a, of a using this um, new approach. Um, basically, it the what they what they saw as the, the the great benefits of it was that it's based on objectives and functionality and performance, which could be standardized globally. What you're trying to achieve globally through through your class applications is generally the same thing, but this gives a way to um, give that more um, uh, recognition. In the country, you have country specifics on acceptance criteria and acceptable alternatives. Um, I'll go a bit more into that in, in um, subsequent slides. The use of the methodology would use technical documents or guidance documents, which would be universal as well, developed um, in laboratories and, and research institutions and worldwide. And, but it did need an increased level of professional training and responsibilities to be able to implement those. So this looking at what this performance-based approach means in the detail there, it's a change to um, focus on performance rather than measures to achieve, to, to achieve those objectives. As a simple example, we can give the high level statement of the objective of evacuation of building in safe conditions is the desired outcome or result. A code, a codified requirement could be maximum travel distance of 50, measure, 50 meters. That's a measure to achieve that objective of the evacuation. So, <clears throat> So then the, uh, the modern fire safety legislation is needed, first of all, to permit this approach, because it needs to recognize that there is a deemed to satisfy way of doing things, and there is an alternative way of doing things. The legislation needs to um, state in some way or another that if you, if you go about the alternative, you need to um, achieve an equivalent level of safety, at least. The overall objectives remain the same. And um, what we, the, the codes are often referred to as life safety codes because the objective of those codes that have developed over the years is basically to ensure that people get out of the building safely in the event of fire and provide protection for the fire brigade for rescue and extinction operations. So when we look at the, at the codes or performance-based approach, that's, that holds true still. If the, the, the main objective is to get people out of the safety in the event of fire. When I started implementing this uh, performance-based approach then, um, the first question that arose, that, ar that arose was, what is an equivalent of level of safety with the specific guidance? Because we don't, when we apply the code to, to a building, we can't, we don't know what level of safety, we know it's a, it's a societally acceptable level of safety um, that has been codified over the years. But to be able to quantify that is very difficult. And if you can't quantify it, then how are you going to demonstrate that it's an equivalent. 
So instead of trying to, the, the first attempts were to try and quantify that using risk assessment approach, um, quantified risk assessment, but it became very complex and, and there were too many variables in it to really uh, have a sensible approach going about it that way. So the, the, the direction change of it and focusing on the objective and the basic requirements and a methodology was developed to um, go through a process for designers to follow to be able to demonstrate that they reached an adequate level of safety with any with any alternative. That that process on, on the right hand side there, there's a there's a there's a, um, a schematic which is taken from an SFPE document, Society for Protection of Fire Safety Engineers document, which sets out. The, pro the, the process in, 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 in a logical format. Um, in different, different countries, the, that process might be slightly different, but they all would follow um, what I've summarized there as the four main, um, the four main contents of that procedure. And the first, the first, um, step one is to identify the aims and objectives so if you're going to provide an alternative design what are you what are the objectives what were the objectives in the prescriptive design and um, we identify that you achieve that same objective to an alternative then you need to set acceptance criteria look at all the different fire scenarios that could, that could happen and then provide a technical justification I'll go into each one of them in a bit more detail just to give a bit more clarity on what, they, what this means. So the first step there is what I've highlighted in blue, covers those first three boxes. That's basically establishing the aims and objectives. The aims would normally be those high level statements that we saw um, in, 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 the, in the way the the codes and the uh, uh, broken down high level statements in the legislation. And the objective would be something more specific, like related to escape or structural stability or continuity. When you're doing uh, in establishing these aims and objectives, personal safety of the of, of the um, occupants is obligatory. That's the legal requirement. You can't avoid that part of it. But a performance-based design allows you to identify other objectives. It could be a property protection objective that isn't met through the, the, the code approach. It could be, um, in, in the case of international airport hubs, for example, you want to ensure continuity. And um, you say your, your downtime is limited to 20 or 30 minutes at a maximum for whatever incident it is. You might be, you want to focus on resilience more. So you can add other things other than personal safety, and this the performance-based methodology gives you a way to to be able to identify that and and, and set that in your in your next step, which is developing your performance criteria. So these the criteria then is what you're going to use to measure whether what you're proposing is acceptable or not. These uh, criteria um, normally need to be uh, agreed upfront between the designers and authorities. Um, if it's open to the designer to propose them, then it's a, a, a process that you need to get um, a specific agreement on it. Sometimes the, uh, the country legislates what are acceptable criteria in some, some instances. Um, I've given just a few examples to illustrate that. Um, when we're looking at um, escape where in an area where smoke could be accumulating, then you can say a typical one would be you maintain, you have to maintain a smoke layer three, three meters above where people need to pass, above the floor level of, of this um, of, of that part of the escape route. Or in the case uh, of another example, there would be atria, uh, the blazing to stop the, uh, um, 
the smoke spread causing um, breakage of the glass and spreading into spreading between floors. You could set um, a temperature of the glazing at 200 degrees Celsius, for example, as your criteria. And then you would use that to measure how acceptable your solution is in it. The next step in that process then is to determine fire scenarios. Now, this is looking at these scenarios, you have to assume that any combustible material could be ignited and deal with consequences. So the number of fire scenarios is, is, is innumerable, you can say, but, the, but the, the, the job of the fire safety engineer would be to reduce those to three or four um, scenarios which represent the worst cases, and then you work with those scenarios in your, in your further development of your design. Also need to um, illustrate here that when you're working with fire scenarios, you need to identify whether it's what we call a localized fire, which means one package of fire, uh, one package of combustibles alight and producing a certain amount of, of heat and smoke. But if that fire starts spreading to all the combustibles in the room, you get to a, a, a stage where it reaches what we call flash over, where all the combustibles in the space are, are, are involved in the fire. And we need to be able to distinguish between those two because once it is the flash over, you can't, it's, it's, it's not habitable at all. Anybody still in that space at that stage would not get out alive. And then the final step in the performance-based uh, procedure is then you've got to demonstrate through some technique that what you're proposing, the measures that you propose, is meets your subject to all those design fire scenarios, meets the criteria, and therefore complies with the objective. Those that uh, the demonstration could be by means of hand calculations. Um, for example, in the, in the illustration on the left, we're just looking at the radiation from one place to another. You can do that with simple thermodynamic equations. But sometimes you need to go to more detailed modeling to be able to uh, demonstrate what the effect of your measures is on the, on the subject to the design fire scenarios. So that's just the, the methodology which has developed over the years. And um, I'll now go to look, look at a bit of um, how this methodology is applied in, in the design. A typical application for this is looking at means of escape. Um, if, you, if you can't meet your code requirements of maximum 50 meters to a safe area, or to a protected route, then you, you need to, you can use a performance-based design to, to show that it's still justifiable. When we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about alternatives, the illustration on the right there shows what the assumption is in a code approach in, in the standard recipe. It assumes that people get off the fire floor within 50 meters or if the alternative escapes available, they move from that into a protected area and then they move from that protected area directly to outside. If you can't achieve that, you need to justify how you're going to get people to the outside safely. So when we go to different alternatives, normally what, what it entails is a calculation of the evacuation time. How long will it take to get everybody out of that building once they have been given warning of the fire? And then an assessment of the conditions in any spaces that people have got to move through, conditions of heat and smoke in that unprotected area um, for the duration of the evacuation time. And then you would take your time for accept that you can maintain acceptable conditions, not times a safety factor, and that must be greater than the time needed to get people out the door. So that's basic, the basics that, um, that you have to demonstrate. 
So if we go to a concrete example of this now, um, this was a this was a typical application for performance-based design for justifying evac safe evacuation. This was a, a, a building by Zaha Adid at the, at the expo in um, Saragossa in 2008. The theme of the expo was water. So they wanted to create a pavilion, a bridge, a bridge over, the, over the river, which was also a pavilion. The problem with that was that the length of the, of the bridge was 280 meters long. They wanted to enclose the whole space to use it as an exhibit area. And so the escape distances was a minimum of 140 meters. It was a public, a publicly accessible area for exhibitions, so it had to cater for large crowds. They would always, it was possible to move in either direction away from the fire source, but the potential for smoke to block that because the smoke accumulating under the test would propagate at a at a speed much much greater speed than you would be able to get all the people of the out of that space. So we we started working with them at uh, at the concept design stage, and of course, you know, is this feasible enough? Are we going to be able to justify this? We know how performance based design. Tell us whether you can, you can, you can manage this or not. So just before I show what we did there, I'll just go to this. I've mentioned smoke a number of times, and um, there's a recognition that it's smoke that uh, kills people. Smoke can move faster than people, it can overcome people easier. And so smoke control is, is the fundamental thing in Evacuation um, design. So how do we how do we calculate how do we deal with the smoke control? And the, the easiest illustration of it is is always comparing it to to that, um, those diagrams on the left where you have a, a bathtub. You open there's a tap opening up with water there. If you just leave that, um, eventually uh, the bath will, the water will overflow into the bath. But if we can calculate the amount of water entering that receptacle, we know the volume of the bath, we can easily calculate what, what, um, what size pile we need to keep the, the water level at a, a constant height or just to ensure that it doesn't overflow. And it's the same principle we apply for smoke control, just that principle inverted. Instead of gravity pulling the water down, the heat of the smoke, the buoyancy raises it up and raises up into, in, into an enclosed area at the roof level, into a determined area. So we can work out the volume of, 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 of the going in. If we can work out how much smoke that fire produces, then we can easily work out what openings, what ventilation is needed to ensure that um, we can maintain the smoke layer at a certain height. The only difference between water and smoke, or the main difference, is that um, the smoke the gravity is a constant, whereas the smoke depends on the, on the temperature and its temperature for its buoyancy. So the further the smoke moves away from the fire source, the more it starts cooling. And you start through contact with the surfaces, the contact with air. It starts cooling, losing its buoyancy, and then falling down to the, to the effect of state loops. So the empirical ways of dealing of calculating um, smoke control requirements, as long as you have a, 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 a limited size of reservoir that you collect from the smoke, as long as it doesn't move too far away from the fire, the empirical calculation, the empirical formula which enables you to Calculate it quite easily. If you, if your, um, if the smoke moves further away and there's nothing to contain it within that limited space, then you have to start modeling much more complex techniques to take into account the heat losses as it moves away from the fire. So that's just a, um, an introduction to smoke control for two 
main considerations. So then if we go back to this building that we're doing, it's a, the, the, it's a good practice. Um, what we, we saw the shape of the building. Um, we could split it into four different pods. And if we could use those pods as smoke reservoirs, then there's a, the, you know, there's a good chance we can um, collect the smoke there. And if we introduce natural ventilation into the facade at higher level, we could find an equilibrium where we could demonstrate that we could follow the smoke above, um, above the evacuation routes for a extended length of time. It didn't mean that um, we, we noticed that, that each of those pods, we could split it into areas which meant that we could use these empirical calculations that would be valid, so that simplified our, our design. We had to then work with a facade designer to ensure that we were introducing enough ventilation and that, so we went through a number of iterations with the architect and facade designer, and developed, you know, subjecting it to those design files I mentioned earlier, calculating the smoke climate and what, what ventilation is required to ensure that it stayed at a high level and that it didn't, couldn't move between from one point to the next. So it had to stay up at a high enough level to not spread between points. So basically, we went through that process that, um, that I showed in that um, illustration earlier, using that using those simple, simple observations of smoke control, the reservoirs, ventilation, and we could demonstrate to the authorities then that um, that we can maintain the, the conditions within that area over at least half an hour, uh, which enabled everybody to get out safely. And that, that solution was justified in the eyes of authority, and so went ahead. And that's the way it was built. And that was the result. You can see from the, the larger picture on the right, in some areas we had introduced quite a lot of uh, ventilation to the side, and in other areas, not so much. But there, it didn't impact on the on, 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 on what the what the the whole practice was trying to achieve for. And so it was a successful application of the performance based approach. I'm thinking about another building which um, which not as well known, but it demonstrates quite well other aspects um, of, the, of the process. This is a building in, in a town of Bilbao in Spain. The top right hand picture shows what, what the original building looked like. It was a perimeter building around a big open square. And the project was to locate three new buildings within that square and then have a, a cover at fourth floor level, which covered the roof and provided for an external zone pool about that. And um, in the diagram on the right, you can see the Just the, 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 the plan area and how those buildings were situated. When we saw this, we, um, the company I was working for was commissioned to look at the, the to advise and structures at concept design stage. When we looked at it, we said you've got some issues here that you're going to need to deal with from a from a um, high safety point of view. One of the main issues was that the escapers didn't follow that model, which the code, presumptive code follows, which takes people into a protected area and then to outside. It takes them from a protected area, protected stairs into a covered area, which we anticipated would cause the authorities a lot of concern. And another issue was the, the, the spacing of the buildings and glass facades on the buildings. So we felt that that would be an issue. They didn't take us on, so we thought that they had sorted it, would have sorted it out to somebody else, but they didn't. And then they came back to us in a bit of a panic because they were about to start this project and the fire authority or the, the building authority had said to them, you can't have that roof on there because you, you've got to get people outside. So we went through a, the same exercise and looking at how to justify extended escape routes 
and escape routes under in, in and through an enclosed area where smoke could be accumulated. We did, um, part of that is looking at the, the uh, evacuation time and that I won't go into the details of it, but we need to break that down into a number of different areas to build up the total time to get people out to the outside. The criteria we used for our smoke control was a typical three meters clear under the, under the smoke layer at the atrium floor level. But then you see the, they had these connecting bridges which took people from the new buildings into those perimeter existing buildings into a protected escape route there and then out. And so they would have to move through an area where smoke could be accumulating as well. So for those, um, we set other criteria that if they were exposed to smoke in those bridges, that smoke had to be maintained at a temperature of less than 60 degrees with good visibility through the smoke. This case, um, the smoke reservoir was not limited to a, a, a size which you could uh, model, which you could calculate with the uh, empirical formula. So we had to go and develop a 3D um, put your fluid dynamics model to be able to model the effects of this of the smoke. And um, I don't know if this will run, but this is that's the model on the left with the, the, the loose notes removed. This is just um, we normally have to provide graphics to discuss this with the authorities. You see, this is this is a graphic of a fire breaking out in the shopping center. At some stage, that uh, the, the blazing breaks and the smoke starts pouring into that space where people could be moving through. So in doing this exercise, we, we need to we introduce natural ventilation around the perimeter in that area in blue in the band in the band on the left. And we carried on a number of, uh, a number of iterations until we could show that the smoke, there was enough ventilation for all the kinds of fires scenarios we're looking at to remove the smoke at a sufficient rate to maintain clear escape routes at atrium level. We managed to do that, and I, it was quite easy to introduce the ventilation into the sides of the perimeter. There was a large perimeter. But with all of these exercises, what often gets forgotten is that these natural ventilation systems only work if you introduce enough clean air at low level to compensate for the smoke being, uh, being ventilated at, at upper level. And it's often that getting that clean air in at low level, which is much more difficult than getting ventilation at high level. But we managed to do that in this, in this case. So through that um, analysis then, we find that we could meet the criteria at floor level, we created enough ventilation, and but we couldn't meet the criteria that we'd set at those bridge levels. So we told them they had to enclose the, 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 blaze, the, 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 the bridges, which they did. But that, that analysis also showed that the smoke temperatures were such that we could use normal glazing, even if you could get a rate of glazing. And so it was quite a simple, non intrusive measure to glaze those, uh, the tops of those, those bridges. Another issue that came out that could, we could illustrate in this building is if you look at this image here, the, the architect, this is Philippe Stark, uh, the French architect who was commissioned to produce this space inside here. And he was very critical about his columns, those, those twirly columns on below the buildings, and these tall steel columns um, that you see in the foreground here. And they're placed in that it's a cruciform shape there. And he wanted to ex expose those. And the authority said to him, again, we found you, um, you've got to protect those columns. And it's caught in the roof, people are, are, are using the roof. So you need to uh, you need to provide a one hour fire resistance for those columns. So the cheap way of doing that is boarding them up. The expensive way is by using intermittent paint. Boarding or spray on applications were, were not contemplated because they would have destroyed the, the, the appearance of these tanks. 
So um, I looked into international bank and found out that uh, it just exceeded by far the budget that they had available. Again, this is something that came up at the last minute. Budgets have been fixed. They couldn't, they couldn't um, afford to put those columns with emptiness and paint uh, to get the one hour file. So we use that analysis that we've done with some additional analysis at lower level and basically calculated the radiation, the smoke temperatures at upper level and higher levels and managed to justify that they could protect just the bottom five meters of those columns. And then we could demonstrate that they could use normal paint for normal protection, ambient protection for the rest of the column because the heat wasn't such that it could affect the stability of the columns. So that was uh, another aspect of this design. Again, came up at the last minute and created a lot of tension, but uh, performance based design uh, let them off. So that introduces just the, the, another area where you would use performance based design is often used, and that's uh, justifying fire resistance. Um, the codes would often call for one, two hours, sometimes four hours fire resistance. And that can become very costly if you're dealing with steel structures. So if you, you can use performance based design to optimize the fire protection quite as long as you can demonstrate that you, with any fire um, scenario, you can maintain the structural stability for the duration required. These calculations would necessarily assume fully developed fires. So this is where we get into the other type of fire. All the combustibles in a compartment need to be exposed to the fire. With steel composite construction, it's often it's often used, and you can you can often demonstrate that if you tie the concrete topping together properly into into all the elements, um, you can you can often justify that you know you can just protect the primary elements and you can leave the secondary elements um, unprotected. That analysis that's running on the right, I think it's running. Um, this shows the type of assessment that you need to do. Um, you need to demonstrate that you can transfer the loads off your unprotected members to your protected members without um, compromising the stability of the structure or only maintaining the compartmentation over three floors. You need to, it's quite that's a very complex um, exercise. You need to look at the heating and cooling phases because often the cooling phase is where the damage arises. It's often more commercially driven than, uh, than driven by life safety requirements, but it is becomes worthwhile when you're looking at high rise buildings with repeated floors, then it might, um, might uh, provide some benefits. But, it can also, you know, looking at um, structural stability, uh, coming back to the, the, the bridge pavilion to illustrate how it can be used sometimes um, for means of escape purposes. This was another, uh, another issue that came about with this, uh, with this design, is that the architect in this, in the, um, within this bridge enclosure had a maximum floor with the ramps come up from them. And they wanted these, they wanted the ramps to appear to be floating within the, within the bridge space. And um, so we told them we couldn't not have any support, we had to have some support. But the structural engineer worked with them and developed the system of light steel rods, colored the same certain color as the interior of the facade. And you would lose the, you would lose the sight of them almost, and you could create that. that um, Appearance of it that's floating maximums and bridges. The problem with these light rods is that it doesn't like to heat up very quickly, and so exposed to any fire, they would, you, know, you can't demonstrate that they can they maintain their stability for any, any significant length of time. So when, when they, um, the, the 
presented with structural solutions of the term that uh, to get that minimum 30 minutes fire protection, we need to encase it with these things which were pretty bulky. And putting them on there, we, lost, we just lost the total appearance of floating. You can see these bulky hangers hanging there, hanging with the resin. So there's a lot of game backwards and forwards there. And see if we could use performance based design to overcome this issue. What we, what we had to, to deal with, and, and I think this is where performance based design really comes into its own, because, because it was an exhibition over a specific length of time. The exhibition defined the materials and the location of those materials. And they could give us all that information. To, to work with in the design of the building. So we could, those fire loads, we could, uh, they were very precise. We could determine exactly where they would be placed and what sort of heat they would be put in. So we got together with the, the structural engineers and doing our calculations of heat transmission to those, to the, to the hangers. We could see that if you place it between two hangers, there was a possibility that you could affect two two different hangers at the same time. So we're not going to increase the spacing a bit to an area where wherever you located the fire, you would only affect one hanger or one line of hangers, I should say, on the new side. And, um, and then they just um, increased the, 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 the spanning capacity of the floor structure slightly inside, which didn't affect the appearance at all, to be able to span a bit further. And then show that with a loss of one hanger, you could transfer the loads to the, the, the impact on the other side. Still. So this was what we presented to the authorities, and um, they kind of liked it. They said that's fine, um, and they they let us, based on that analysis, they permitted it. But they said after the expo, this building is going to be used for other uses, so we need to protect it later on. So what we did is we, we developed uh, the, the encasements, which were um, dismountable or remountable, and they were stored in the in underneath the floor space of the of the pavilion for, for application after the expo. So we actually managed to achieve what what was um, what that was wanted to for the expo, and also find a way to back the building easily later on. To the satisfaction of the authorities using this approach. I think that's um, all we've got time to do that in, in detail. I'll just go quickly through some typical applications where we, as you know, so it's um, a performance based design, provides you know, with a lot of possibilities. Particularly um, transport terminals, where you have large crowds of people, long distances. Large covered areas, shopping centers, high rise buildings, historic buildings where often your, your um, cultural um, requirements or your, uh, your, uh, your, your legislation for the protection of, of heritage buildings doesn't allow you to do certain things. So you can find different ways to, to ensure the safety in those buildings. Buildings of atria is something which almost always needs uh, the input of a fire engineer to apply some performance based effect. And the stadium is a large number of people to need to evacuate in, within, safely within a specific time. So, just looking at shopping centers, we'd um, say that performance based approach is often used to address evacuation times for large members of public. In enclosed conditions. An issue with shopping centers is that um, you have high loads or storage loads in retail areas, but you want a shop front, which is a light shop front to, to expose with the, with the, the retail space to the public. And so you, you can't separate physically um, the high power loads from the public thoroughfare areas. That needs to be dealt with. We need to control the smoke either at source or in, in, the, in the public thoroughfares. Often you need phased evacuation arrangements to prevent um, 
chaos in the recreation procedure. So the, the, the performance-based approach can, can help you achieve that. And also the try to get access to deep brown areas is often something which you need to find alternative solutions to. The atrium spaces, they provide it to create environmentally friendly and pleasant spaces, maximize great to light to floors, provide as much natural ventilation as you can. But you do have the issue of the rise in smoke, um, increasing a lot in volume and affecting escape routes, accumulation of space in open spaces at the upper levels. Um, you, know, you need to limit the smoke temperature or within fire spread, and also fire spread between floors at the edges of the atrium is something which needs to be looked at it from the first principles point of view. And then I've just mentioned something else where you can, we mentioned that um, performance-based design allows for innovation and different type of solutions. So if you're looking for sustainability, there's a drive now for the use of structural Timber, timber in high rise buildings, the prescriptive code, prospective code doesn't allow that at all. So, um, a performance based approach is being used now, and the justification is often using known engineering properties of timber, but also backed up with experimentation for those kind of new areas. The specific areas that need to be addressed there are stability of the combustible structural elements. Horizontal and vertical fire spread, behavior of connections subjected to high temperature, because these connections are normally steel, you try and embed them within the timber, but um, to create a totally heat resistant connection is very difficult. Other connections are what's shown in that, that top illustration there, where it's a composite timber concrete floor, where the, the, an adhesive is used to bind the, the timber to the concrete, and we need to do experimentation to look at whether that adhesion is maintained at high temperature. And also something to with them that needs to be considered with timber is the higher fire risk during construction, which has caused a lot of problems in some areas. So let's, let's look at the application of this in design. When we look at prescriptive design, so you know, in, in fire safety, traditionally, the architect would be um, responsible mainly for the evacuation system, the components of that, compartmentation, perhaps access, access for fire services, all the physical things in, in, the, in, the, in the fabric of the building. The engineer would typically be responsible for systems designs, detection alarms, suppression, smoke control systems. But a fire strategy is a combination, it's a suite of measures. And these measures are interdependent. So when you're dealing with prescriptive design, the architect would know what the engineer is supposed to do, the engineer would know what the architect is supposed to do. But when you're doing uh, uh, when you're dealing with a performance-based design, if you change something in your compartmentation or your state, you need to you need to introduce measures to justify that. And that's uh, you know, those measures are interdependent. You need to, there needs to be a full integration of all those measures to be able to do them sensibly. And that's why the figure of the fire safety engineers come about to develop that fire strategy, bringing the architecture, the engineering, and any other components together within, a, within the design to ensure that your total suite of measures is maintained. Then you need consultation with all stakeholders in applying the performance-based design. And the earlier you do that, the better. But the, the diagram just tries to illustrate that the, the, the blue curve going down means you have a lot of scope to do things at feasibility and concept stage of the design, but that drops off as you go down through your design progression. And then on the other hand, the effect of your changes of what you introduce are normally very economical. So if you stop them straight away, you can just make adjustments. But then as you go through the design process to introduce them, you get into 
um, the custody rules. When dealing with the building authorities, you need to develop a trusting authority, a trusting partnership with them, because basically the building authority feel that their head is on the bar. If people die in the fire, they feel that they and they land up in a courtroom having to explain why they permitted what they did in approving that design. And so if they can, with this prescriptive approach, they can just say, you tick these boxes, they were ticked, okay. But with a performance-based design, they need to go beyond that and um, just say, the designer needs to take them along with the process to make sure that they're familiar with what's been done and feel comfortable with it all the way through. Otherwise, you're going to need to say that they just say, no, you can't do that. Apply the code. Fire services, if, um, they normally they would be consulted on various like um, fire prevention intervention. And then the building owner and developer, you would always consult at, um, all the way through because it's just to manage the risk of non approval. Because sometimes we find that we have great ideas and can create great spaces, and then we come up against um, later on with somebody who's not comfortable with that and puts a software process, and you have to go back to a little more, much more intrusive and, and uh, not very aesthetic solution to, to it. So if we just look then at the covered performance-based approach and a prescriptive approach, here are the advantages and disadvantages. For performance-based approach, we've seen that the response to logic of identified objectives and, so, and therefore provides a diverse way of compliance. It's open to innovation. You can set whatever criteria, objectives you, you want, as long as you can justify them. And it's, it's a common global approach. So input into it, you get from all over and it's developing um, globally as we go on um, the issues are being identified and, and designed. Disadvantages are that it's more complex in the design process. So it needs more skilled practitioners to implement it, um, to implement it um, with reason. And the approvals process is more difficult. So that is a big disadvantage on the approvals authority. If you look at it from an approval authority point of view, a prescriptive approach, there they see the advantage of it. They don't need to think about the why. They, just, they don't need to consider whether objectives have been met. They just tick a box to say what measure has been included or not. Approvals. And control is a lot more straightforward, therefore, for a prescriptive approach, and enforcement is simpler. But the disadvantage is that it's not open to innovation. It's based only on past experience, so it doesn't open up your design to new firms and, and uh, uses of the building. And the rules and interpretation of how they get applied are country based, so it could be very different from one country to, to the next. So this is my last slide just to conclude then. I say it's a very powerful tool. Performance-based design is a powerful tool for enabling innovation in design. Enabling its use requires legislation to clearly set out how it can be used um, to have it. And we need a clear approvals process in place as well to be able to apply it. It needs more developed fire engineering skills to be able to apply it. It requires a good understanding of the aims and objectives, both of the descriptive code and of, um, of what you're trying to achieve in your fire safety design. So it presents challenges to authorities. Authorities need to be prepared for it before it's introduced. And it needs integration. It needs a, an integrated design team approach to be able to ensure that you connect all the dots as you go along. So I'll leave it at that, and um, I hope we're going to get some time for questions or comments. Um, I've covered a, a lot of ground, and it is a fairly complex um, issue, but I hope it's given you some insight into what the issues are that you need to deal with.
um, so, so thank you, George, for your nice presentation. So I like to open the questionnaire session. So uh, Professor Noki, would you like to ask anything or contribute anything? Uh, I think you are mute. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor Mannan. Uh, yes, I do have many a question, but I will select one. Um, well, uh, the performance-based, as far as I've understood, uh, uh, the performance-based approach is actually, it's about uh, the human behavior. That is, uh, it, it stresses on the evacuation process and the process how the fire brigade people will get into the building and even the behavior of the materials of the building. Am I right? Yes, that's right. Uh, and then, uh, well, fine. Uh, this, this approach will be more creative and more innovative, no doubt about it. But how to evaluate that process? I think that process will be very, very difficult, wouldn't it be? Yes. Um, so as I said, it needs, uh, it is the, the arrival of performance-based design coincided with the arrival of the discipline of fire engineering. So... <clears throat> In, um, fire safety was always looked at as a bit of a mystical art to do, you know, where you have these, you have all these um, measures, these requirements codified and how they get interpreted and how they get introduced into the building and whether they are um, acceptable or not is, is up, to, up to interpretation or not. And so, with a performance-based design, you need to, um, it becomes a much more scientific approach. So you need to develop a body of science behind it. And that is what the, the fire engineer community, which basically started coming about in the, in the late 19, say 1990s. That's when, in the 1980s, there, were some, there was a bit of um, movement in that area. But it's in the 1990s that, um, institutions started coming into being, fire safety, fire engineering institutions, and people compared it a bit with um, what happened at the beginning of the 19th, or the, yeah, the, the beginning of the 19th century, where up until, up until 1900, so the architect was responsible for structures, ventilation, light, fire, everything in the building. The structures became developed into a much more scientific and precise um, engineering discipline. And so that eventually became a different discipline on its own. And, and it was left out of the architecture's normal handling. And so people often compare what happened now at the end of the 19th century with fire safety engineering is that that's the same, the same thing has happened there. Fire safety was always under the control, under the scope of the architect, who would interpret it, interpret it in a, as best way as they could, but there wasn't a very scientific basis to it. And so with a performance-based design, you have to become more scientific about it to be able to demonstrate what works and what doesn't work. And um, so that discipline of fire safety engineering has come, has come about largely due to the introduction of performance-based design. And if we look at it, structural design has always been performance-based. You calculate the structure to see that it meets an objective. The objective is normally to withstand gravity or seismic loads. And uh, in the same way, fire safety engineering sets those objectives, they're slightly different but it sort of develops a body of science behind demonstrating that. Yeah. So I hope that okay. answers your, your question. Yeah, uh, thank you, George. Um, so, uh, Professor Noki, do you have any, any more questions? No, no, I, I think we oh, should oh, It was a nice question, actually. We are up to some sort of performance-based architecture as well. So, i like to ask uh, Professor Mustafa Asan. So, uh, so because uh, I know that he is working in his uh, tall, uh, studio with a tall building and they try to do something with performance-based analysis and other things. So he should have some questions for George. 
uh, Professor Musawi. Hey, hi, George. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Raja. Hi, George. This was a, a wonderful presentation. And I enjoyed it. And at some points, uh, it was a bit uh, difficult for me to understand. I would say that, frankly. Uh, I have two questions for you. First of all, uh, we are doing uh, a tall building projects in our studio in the third year. Uh, there is one part where we have to provide an access route, which is totally uh, enclosed, like it cannot open to the outside. So what happens is it divides the ground floor into two uh, separate parts because we have to have this passage from the central core uh, leading to the outside. So it kind of divides the ground floor into two parts. So uh, that's where uh, our students face a challenge regarding uh, its architectural perspective. So that is about our uh, students. That is one question. The other question I would like to ask you is in our garment industries, we come across a lot of uh, designs uh, uh, for garment buildings. Uh, so what kind of approach uh, would you recommend? Like if we want to try out uh, performance-based uh, design uh, processes, uh, what kind of approach would you recommend as designers uh, we try to kind of adapt uh, or try to learn uh, or try out in our in our country like as beginners so those would be my two questions okay and the first question uh, your comment about it uh, being complex is um, i should let you know that what what i've tried to cover and give you some insight into is the subject of a master's course in fire engineering so i've tried to give you a flavor of it and um, I couldn't, I couldn't go into the details of it. Um, that, that issue you discussed, um, if I envisage it right, it's something which I've come across in, in high-rise buildings where they, you have a certain way of bringing people down to one level and then it opens up into an open area and splits and, and, and goes into another system before leaving people outside. And basically what you... What you what we need to demonstrate is that um, wherever where they come out of the first protected system into an internal unprotected system, um, you they they the conditions are acceptable for them to come through. Normally, that would mean smoke-free, or or the smoke is directed in a way that it that it wouldn't interfere with those routes. Um, and in a, in the building that comes to mind, we did that, we, we did a bit of an evacuation uh, as assessment. Uh, um, uh, we, we, a fluid dynamics assessment of the evacuation to look at the evacuation times and accumulations of people. We did that. And then in the areas below where that split happened, we had to enclose them to ensure that um, the fire couldn't break out and send smoke into into, the, into that area. In some areas, we just had to direct the smoke and control it at, up, at higher level where it wouldn't affect the people. So, you know, you, that, that's the typical case where if you look at that at concept design stage, you will look at the different, uh, the different, the, there's always a number of ways you can address it. It's trying to separate any fire load from, from that area or controlling any smoke that emanates from it in a way that doesn't affect it. And um, yeah, you need to sit down together, looking at the, di at, the, at the building, seeing what you want to, to create in all the spaces, what's possible to, to do. So uh, it's, 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 there's no, I can't give an answer to it, but uh, okay. normally what you do is you ensure that um, smoke yeah, that, that, that route remains usable over a few evacuation time or a minimum of 30 minutes. Um, the other question you asked about the RNG building. So I've, um, I've been coming to Bangladesh since 2013, and my initial involvement was looking at fire safety in RNG buildings and did a lot of inspections. The way they built, the way that just about all of the factories that I've been into are built is a, a prescriptive approach applied properly would cater for all the issues. I've 
I've thought about um, you know, we have uh, ventilation often on the side and could that be used, but that type of ventilation wouldn't provide smoke control. Smoke control needs to maintain a layer of smoke and certain height. So uh, uh, you know, I, <coughs> typically in industry, the, the issues that we would deal with were, were are large, large distances uh, that need to be accommodated. Um, in factories I've seen in Bangladesh, because your, your land space is normally limited, um, you go up instead of across. So I think the prescriptive prescriptive approach, the BNBC even applied properly, would cater for the life safety issues in the factories that I've seen in Bangladesh. And when we come into these existing factories, we see a lot of problems which are expensive to, to remediate because we built in bad practice. And we built it in a way that doesn't comply. And it's always it costs five to 10 times the amount to remediate something than to pick it up at the design stage and build it properly in the first place. So, so um, yeah, so the short answer is that the building, the buildings that I've been into, the factories that I've been in, I've been into a lot, most of them, for the life safety issues would be dealt with adequately by proper application of the prescriptive code. If you want to do different things for, you know, often we come with different uh, manufacturing processes, mean they want to do this or that for the spaces, and that introduces other, other issues which we would deal with on a performance-based approach. But in the, in the RNG, the, the cut so finished buildings that we've been into, prescriptive code is, provides what you need. Okay, uh, uh, so, uh, George, I have quite a few questions from uh, um, participants, those who are uh, watching live in the Facebook. So I, I, I think it's probably from uh, some of our students. So they are asking, is it difficult to ensure fire safety in organic shape buildings? So it's going to repeat that fire safety in? in organic, it means Zahadi kind of buildings. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's um, it's 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 more difficult to to yeah you know, you've got to go through a process to to demonstrate it. The, the difficulty is that you haven't got a recipe of measures which address the issues that you faced with. So the authorities don't have it either. So the authorities' approach often is you can't do that. Put up walls yeah. here, put up this, open it, take the roof off, then it complies with the prescriptive code. So that's one approach, just change a building. <laughs> but then that doesn't allow you to, to build these. Uh, and it's not just um, very exotic buildings, it's often like an airport terminal. An airport terminal, the, the, the first airports that they used to, terminals that they used to do, they, they followed compartmentation rules. And so your site, your, your, your wayfinding around the airport is a nightmare. And so to create wayfinding, they opened up spaces and you can see long distances and makes it much more uh, user-friendly and much more practical, much more functional. But then there's the code says 50 meters maximum distance to an escape. So then you need to, you need to find a way to justify that. And it's, it's, it's a typical application of performance-based design is to show that with any fire that can occur in a terminal building, the smoke goes up and is dealt with at high level and allows people to get out safely. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the issues that are raised is in creating better functionality of your building. That means you can't apply the code measures. The prescriptive code measures You've got to understand they, they have to make a lot of assumptions. To be able to develop a recipe, they've got to be assumptions. The typical assumptions are that you have normal ventilation of a window space, say 15, 20% of your facade is ventilation. Your ceiling height is 30, is three meters high. So your smoke is going to be affected 
quickly so get people out in a short distance. So all these things are built into the prescriptive code, which has to make these assumptions to be able to describe measures. When you go beyond that, those measures, you out of your prescription, so you have to you have to have a, a way to deal with it and the performance based approach. So I think the difficulty or not, a prescriptive approach is always easier, but then you've got to adapt to build into the assumptions of a prescriptive approach. If you want to design for functionality and aesthetics or whatever, you do your design and then you see if the prescriptive approach meets it or it doesn't, you've got the performance based approach which you can use to, to justify as much as possible. Okay, that don't, I think that was a very helpful answer. So uh, from my side, I have a one question. So since you were staying in Bangladesh for last 2013, you are saying, definitely you have seen uh, many things here. Um, and uh, I found in, in, in my uh, profession, I found that we least bothered about fire safety or safety, life safety. So I don't know from where it came, uh, why we are not, why architects are not aware of these kind of things, even uh, in the in the maximum because Professor Noki is there, so uh, probably uh, he can uh, he can clarify this as well. So right, uh, uh, even most of the university, not actually not most, none of the university, technical universities universities they uh, um, have any curriculum related to life safety. So I don't know why. Even in my university, when we try to implement some sort of uh, related, uh, um, it means lectures and other things, we always face some obstructions or people think that this is very easy, but these are not very easy. So uh, what is your perspective regarding this? Because I know, I know that ILO is working on academia kind of things um, or started or trying to work with that. So what is your perspective in this regard? Okay, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that question because that, brings me to something which we're trying to be really pushing for in ILO. And that's, you know, we've been working on remediation of factories for a long, for a lot. And the point we want to get across is that, we, that there's not enough ten, attention being placed in Bangladesh on the getting the building prepared for fire safety before it's occupied. And the reason why you, you don't have curricula in the universities is that the enforcement process is not there. Well, it's, 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 um, it's, it's hardly existent. I think it's existent in paper. But um, if, I do, if I do design here, and I, I'm not going to go through the same process with the, the building authority, um, I won't be grilled on how, to, how I'm trying to justify what I'm doing. By a, by a building authority before they give the license to construct. So I think in, I wonder if I can, if I can move my slide on, I can I actually anticipated this question. And this was a slide that I developed for uh, uh, something that we were discussing recently. Basically in Bangladesh, all the focus has been on fire services, management and workers in the, in the premises, labor inspection. And those are the, that's part of your fire safety enforcement process. But the fundamental part is getting the buildings right before they occupy it. And because that's very weakly enforced in Bangladesh, that hasn't created a market for engineers to have to develop the, the, the knowledge and the techniques to justify it in front of authority. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't drive a market for the universities to develop curriculum. Because if, if um, practitioners, if the buildings are being built without these things being enforced, then you don't have a market for developing curriculum to prepare people to do it. So and that's, and I think that that has been my observation in all my, my time here. And I think um, the focus is on fire safety is too much on after the building is occupied, whereas all your life safety issues related to the building 
or, or made the present of them, are contained in your, your, your building codes, which need to be enforced before that building is occupied. So that's the that's the big link that's missing. And in ILO, we, we, we've been approaching um, donors and development partners with a proposal to try and work with the government to look to try and get that enforcement process in place, which will drive a lot of these other things that we're talking about. Uh, thank you, George, uh, for the answer. Yeah, that's maybe the uh, present scenario of our academia. So I'd like to uh, ask um, um, uh, Professor Hanna, uh, if you have, sorry, if you have any questions to George. No, I do not have actually any question. I must thank actually George Feller for giving such a wonderful presentation, thoroughly giving a background of even about the matter like fire hazards and also chronologically giving the updates about what sh should we do. So uh, I do not have any specific questions, Sharias. Uh, so, once again, thank you very much, actually. Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, uh, I think we are still coming up with a lot of questions, but I like to take only one question. Uh, uh, with that, uh, we may conclude, uh, in, uh, conclude the session. So that is, what kind of method we can apply on uh, fire safety in the uh, old Dhaka, it means old part of the Dhaka. I'm not sure if uh, George, you are familiar with the uh, old part of Dhaka. Yes, yes, I am. We a few years ago after the after the incident with the, um, the I think it was a chemicals um, storage in Nimtoli, yeah, in, in, yeah. We, put, we started putting together some uh, a proposal to try and address the issue in, in Old Dhaka. And um, I, I, I work also with an NGO that looks at fires in informal settlements. Dhaka is not an, Old Dhaka is not an informal settlement, but I think the, the way to address the issue there is, we, you know, it, it's not just a technical issue. It's the need to work with the, with the population there trying to, so what, what our proposal was going to do was to um, take one area and, and do a, a sort of a public, um, a public event where we would produce these cards which specify the, the, main, the main risks of storage of chemicals in, 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 in residential areas. And then we'd go down around and try and point out where you can see there's obvious risks and, and try and help volunteers within the within the community. And we were thinking about using the, the fire services to work with the volunteer fire service. We we're going to uh, collaborate with them and just help them to identify those risks and then put, um, identify some quick fixes that you could apply to those to those risks. Um, to, and then follow up with training of trainers to spread that out more widely within within Old the, the, the you know it's, it's an infrastructure which is being built, and uh, people are living there. It's a mixture of storage, industrial, and, and, and dwellings, and residential. So I think the, the main my main concern would be to try and identify where the obvious risks are and use the local population to um, help them help identify where those risks are and, and then introduce some, some simple measures or quick fix measures as much as possible. And in that process then get them registered if, if the storage areas get them registered with the appropriate authorities and then try and make a connection for the authorities to have a, a longer term follow up to them. So it's, uh, yeah, as I said, it's, not, it's, it's more of a communal social approach than a technical approach that, because it's a big existing issue. For this. Okay, yeah, it means you are suggesting some sort of uh, public participation 
uh, to ensure the safety of the people in all Dhaka Park. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so uh, thanks, George. Um, uh, Halan sir, we like to uh, conclude. Uh, it means um, close the session. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, so I like to thank everyone who have uh, here for last one and a half uh, half hour uh, and uh, having some questions also. And um, uh, George has uh, given us a very uh, in-depth idea of what is performance based and how it's going to address the future of architecture. So with that slide, I like to thank George again and all the participants and especially Professor Noki. Uh, his his uh, uh, his concern actually encouraged us because he's an architect as well. So uh, thank you, uh, George. Uh, we are going to uh, close the session, right? Uh, thank, thanks a lot to Professor Chaudhary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and George. Uh, also thank you very much for organizing it and for all that and for all those who attended. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.